Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, thank you. It is wonderful to see you on this uh, last Sunday in December. December? No, that's not right. October. Thank you. Uh, apparently, the year has gone by so fast that I don't even know what month it is anymore. The last Sunday in October, we have two months left in the year, and it is wonderful to see you. Uh, some of you are dressed in Halloween costumes, and I'm grateful that I'm not the only one. Thank you for not making me make a fool of myself this morning. Um, it is wonderful to have you here. As we begin our worship this morning, we do so by acknowledging the territory. And I just realized why that's looking at me. I forgot to announce our music license number is A6091891. We're grateful to Dwayne for playing for us and to Beth for doing our chat. Now, let's acknowledge the territory. We, as we gather for worship, we remember that this has been the traditional land of the Lakota, Nakota, Dakota, Cree, Soto, and Métis peoples for generations. As people of the United Church, we remember and we repent of the harm that we have done to the indigenous peoples of this land, and we commit to living in relationships of reconciliation. Our call to worship this morning is printed in your bulletin. It is written by Joanne Marauder. Um, as always, your, your response is in bolded print, and it will either be on your, in your bulletin or on the screen. We are not on the mountaintop or in Jerusalem. We are not in the temple or in an ancient cathedral. We have no gilded cherubim, no ancient holy vessels. Yet we are sheltered by the divine wings, connected to our sacred past, even here, even now. Let us give thanks for this place. Let us worship God. And so we light our Christ candle today to be reminded of God's presence both within these walls and outside of them. And let us pray. Mighty God, the splendor of Solomon's temple cannot compare to the majesty of your heart. Show your heart in this place that we might worship you with joy and gratitude. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is number 315 in Voices United. That's our Burgundy book, Holy, Holy, Holy. I'll invite you to stand as you are able to sing.
comes to us from the book of First Kings. We're going to read a short section from chapter 5 and then skip over to chapter 8. Section in chapter 5 is entitled Preparations and Material for the Temple. Now King Haram of Tyre sent his servants to Solomon when he had heard that he had anointed him king in place of his father, for Hiram had always been a friend to David. Solomon sent word to Hiram, saying, You know that my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the warfare with which his enemies surrounded him, until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor misfortune. So I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord said to my father David, your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, shall build the house for my name. And then we skip over the actual building of the temple because that takes three chapters and I didn't think you'd actually want me to stand here and read that entire thing to you. And we come to the dedication of the temple. Then Solomon assembled the elders of, the, of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the ancestral houses of the Israelites before King Solomon in Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. All the people of Israel assembled to King Solomon at the festival in the month of Etham, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came and the priests carried the Ark. So they brought up the Ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. The priests and the Levites brought them up. King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were with him before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. Then the priests brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house, in the most holy place, underneath the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the ark, so that the cherubim made a covering above the ark and its poles. The poles were so long that the ends of the poles were seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from outside. They are there to this day. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone that Moses had placed there at Horeb, when the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites, when they came out of the land of Egypt. And when the priest came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. I have built you an exalted house a place for you to dwell in forever. The story of God. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So when I was a kid, I spent many, many days and weeks, uh, especially in the summer, but throughout the year at my grandparents' cottage. They had a cottage up in Muskoka, which is um, the, it's called cottage country in Ontario. There's lots of trees and rocks and water, and, and it's just a beautiful place to go and, and relax. We always said that one day on the dock at the cottage felt like a whole week. It was time just slowed down. And so we spent most of our days outside, except when it was raining. Because when it's raining, it's kind of miserable to be outside. And so when we would come inside, when it was raining, we would play all sorts of games and we'd make up all sorts of games and do all sorts of wonderful things as a family. But one of my sisters and my favorite things to do was to build card houses. Any of you ever done card houses? So we, we started out with card houses and then we progressed to card cities. <laughs> and we would take over the sunroom, which was not a large room, but not a small one either. And we would take over that room and we would yell at anybody who dared to come near because even the vibrations of footsteps would take the, uh, the cards for a tumble. 
And so we would take over this thing and we would build roads and we, we, we would have like eight decks of cards built into <laughs> these buildings that had multiple stories and had stairs and had roads and we went all out. No matter how good we were at, they always fell down. It might be 30 seconds, it might be 30 minutes, but at the end of the day, a card house never stands for eternity. And so when I was thinking about the story of building the temple today, I was thinking about how Solomon put so much work into it, so much thought into building this great and beautiful and glorious house for God, believing that it would stand for all eternity. And the reality is, we know it didn't. It was destroyed in 586 BCE. Um, it was then rebuilt after the Babylonians had conquered Israel, um, deported them into exile for a while. They came back eventually. They rebuilt the temple. It stood for a couple of centuries. Um, and then it was destroyed again in 70 AD, and it has never been rebuilt. And so I, I think about these things, and I think that even our greatest buildings, even our greatest monuments, in the end are no more permanent than that house of cards that we used to build. They may stand for a lot longer than 30 seconds, but they still eventually will fall. But the good news is that God doesn't live in a house of cards. God doesn't even live in a house of wood and brick and stone. God's house is among God's people. And so it's not a bad thing for us to build buildings. It's not a bad thing for us to build churches or monuments or any of those things. It's when we start attributing and attaching to them the qualities of God. When we start saying God is only here. When God is only in the United Church and not in any of those other ones. Well, when, you know, God is only in this building and not outside of it. When God is only in human-made things, then we have forgotten who God is. And when our human-made structures crumble, then we think we have lost God. But the good news is that God is never lost because God never called this place home to begin with. God maybe came here, but God is always and forever all around us. Nothing is permanent, friends. And sometimes that itself is the good news. So today we're going to sing one of my favorite hymns. I know I say that a lot. <laughs> Um, but this one is one of my favorites because it reminds us that it's not about just building physical places. It's about so much more than that. And so I invite you to sing with me number one in voices, there are more voices. It's nice and easy to find. Number one, let us build a house.
So at the beginning of every um, sermon uh, in this last few weeks when we've been doing the narrative lecture, I feel like we need to have a section that's called How Did We Get Here? How do we get from our last week's service to here? Because we have trans transversed a book and a half in the scripture and about 65 years worth of material in one week. We're time travelers. We're, we're doing pretty well. So last week we left off with uh, David, the shepherd boy who was out in the fields while his seven other brothers got to check and see if they were the, uh, the right fit for the shoe. Oh no, that's the wrong story. Um, <laughs> whether or not they were to be the anointed of God. Uh, and, and David is anointed as going to be the next king. But remember, Saul is still king at this point. Even though God has said, no, it's okay, we're going to move on to somebody new, Saul is still king and stays king for about 15 years. David was a teenager. He grows up into a young man and is, is um, not anointed, is uh, crowned king. So there's about 15 years between his anointing and his coronation. And then he rules for about 40 years. He reigns for about 40 years. And then his son Solomon is anointed and crowned as king after him. So again, we're, we're kind of 65 years and a book and a half later. In that time, David had lots of children, many wives resulted in many children. And uh, some of them in his later years, as he was uh, starting to get a little bit weaker, as he was getting closer to death, started to, um, a jockey and, and vie for the position. One of them even went so far as to anoint himself and proclaim himself king while his dad was still alive, which did not sit well with Solomon's mother. Solomon's mother was Bathsheba, and she went to David and said, hey, didn't you say that my son Solomon was going to be king? What's going on with this other son of yours who has taken the crown while you're still alive? What's going on here? And David goes, oh, yeah, okay. And then immediately following that, the prophet Nathan, who has been uh, one of David's advisors throughout his reign, comes in and says, uh, my king, did you know that this son of yours has grabbed the crown for himself? I thought you said it was going to be Solomon. Now, Bathsheba and Nathan had talked about this. They planned it out that they were going to go in one after the other. David didn't know that. So to David, it just looks like, hey, my wife said this. My advisor says this. Maybe I should do this. Bathsheba and Nathan were being a little sneaky. But it worked. David said, yes, you're right. I said that Solomon will be king, and by golly, he will be. He is, as of today, I am, I am crowning him. He is now the king. He can go tell all the rest of my sons that it's not their job. <laughs> they don't have it. So Solomon is now king. And in the early days of his reign, he decides to pick up on something that his father David had wanted to do but had not done, and that is to build a temple for God. So in an earlier story, one that we actually heard last year, so you may have to travel your brains back a year, uh, David decides that he wants to build a temple for God. David is, uh, has just looked at his own beautifully built and just finished palace, and he's sitting with Nathan the prophet, his advisor, and he says to Nathan, this doesn't seem right. I've got this big, beautiful house, and God is living in a tent. I'm going to make God a house. And Nathan says, yeah, that sounds like a great idea, King. Let's, let's do that. Let's build God a house. And so David goes to God and says, God, I've got this great plan. You're going to love it. I am going to build you the most magnificent house there is. And God says, I didn't ask for a house. Who told you to build me a house? I don't want a house. I'm happy in a tent. Thanks very much. And David goes, oh, <laughs> what do you mean <laughs> you don't want a house? 
And so God says, well, you know, I'm, I'm happy in a tent. I've been wandering in a tent for a lot of years with you people. I'm happy there. Well, I don't. We just put this on the back burner for a while. You, you won't build me a temple, but your son will. You're, you're, the next in line will build me a temple. Now, whether God actually wanted a temple or thought that maybe David would forget about the temple, I don't know. But I'm sure that Solomon heard for his entire life the story of God says that you are going to be the one to build this beautiful house for God. So early in Solomon's reign, he gets it in his head that, huh, I should probably do this. Now, whether or not he is fulfilling his own desires and own wishes, or if he's just doing it because his father, as a, as a last act of honor for his dad, who he has loved, and he, he believes this is what his dad wanted him to do, we'll never know. But he does build this temple. Now, Solomon is not going to build the temple by himself. He's not even going to build the temple only with Israelites because he recognizes that he doesn't know how to build a temple. <laughs> the, the people in his country um, are not the master um, uh, wood carvers and stone quarriers. They are uh, not the ones who know and have the skilled trades to do this thing. And so we heard about King Tyre, King Hiram of Tyre, who wrote to David, or wrote to Solomon and said, you know, hey, congratulations. Uh, your, your dad has crowned your king. What can I do to help? And Solomon writes back and says, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to build a temple for God, and I need your help to do it. I need your materials. I need the cedars of Lebanon. I need the, the physical trees, the physical lumber from your part of the world. And I could use some help doing it because I can send my guys to cut down trees, but we don't know what we're doing <laughs> So could you help us out there? And the king of Tyre says, sure. Whoa, we'll help. And so David uses the workers from neighboring nations. He also conscripts people from Israel. He, he uh, has a rotating schedule of your one month going out to the Lebanon and, and working in the quarries, working in the lumber fields. And then your two months at home, your one month back out again. There's some discussion as to whether or not that was a use of slave labor, which if it was, it's kind of one of those things of, you guys just got out of slavery. What are you doing putting yourselves into it again? Um, the, the best reading I've heard of it is that it's more like conscription. You don't have the opportunity to say no, but you're still getting paid at least a somewhat fair wage. may not be a lot, but you might get, you might get something. Um, when the temple is finished, it takes seven years, and when the temple is finished, uh, Solomon brings God home. He brings the Ark of the Covenant, which is where God is thought to reside, and the Tent of Meeting, which is the tent that God has resided in, into the temple. He places the Ark and the Tent in the Holy of Holies, the holiest space in the center of the temple. This was the place that nobody went into. The high priest, one person could go in on one day a year to make atonement for the sins of the nation and then had to leave. Every other day of the year, nobody else could go into this place because this was where God was. This was the holy place. And so God comes. God comes with the tent. God comes with the ark. God comes and fills that space so full of cloud and majesty and awe that people can't even be in there, not because they're not allowed to be, but because they're just, they're in such awe that they're backing away. They come out and Solomon says, and I love this, he says that God chooses to reside in deep darkness. I love that imagery because so often in our scriptures, we talk about God being only in the light. You know, that if you're in, that if you're in the shadows, God's there with you, kind of trying to drag you out of it. In this scripture, God resides in deep darkness. 
it's easy to look at Solomon's temple and to go to one end or the other on the spectrum of love and hate. It's easy to say, yes, this was what Solomon was supposed to do. He built this beautiful place for God. God deserves this and more. And so this was exactly right. It's also easy to go to the other side and say, no, he didn't do this ethically. He shouldn't have been doing this. He could have used the money for a whole lot of other things. He should have been nicer to the workers, you know, and he shouldn't have done this. But both sides tend to miss what I think Solomon was trying to do, whether he went about it the right way or the wrong way, that's up for debate. But what he was trying to do was to remind people and to bring people's focus back to God. Because when they had wandered in the desert for 40 years, God had gone with them in tents, literally gone before them, right? Every time they packed up to move, they packed up the tent of meeting, they packed up the Ark of the Covenant, they put the big poles on it, the priests took one shoulder, you know, took the pole on one shoulder, and they went in front of the gathering of people. God moved with them. When they got into cities and weren't moving around so much, it's easy to start forgetting. It's easy to look at the other buildings and go, oh, these are so beautiful. What's that ugly tent over there? Even if it's the most beautiful tent in the world, it's going to look a little weird when you're in the city. And so Solomon says, let's make God the center of our lives. Let's put God literally back in the center, in the biggest building you can find, in the most magnificent, in the most beautiful building you can find, so we can never forget God's importance in our lives. Do we do that? Sometimes I'm going to guess. I know what the answer is for me, and I'm going to guess the answer for you is sometimes. Sometimes, yes. And sometimes, no. I love the imagery of the posts sticking out, the poles sticking out from the Ark of the Covenant. So the Ark of the Covenant is, as I said, the most holy place, the, the place where God literally resides in this understanding of God's relationship with humanity. And because it is so holy, you cannot touch the Ark of the Covenant. If you do, you are struck dead. That is the way the scripture goes. Is we, we have scriptures that say, so-and-so accidentally touched the Ark of the Covenant because he was falling and went to to you know, stop himself from falling over, hit the Ark of the Covenant, instead of falling over, he died. So they put poles in. They had these little rings on them. They put these poles so that they had enough space so they could walk and they could carry the cup of the Ark without actually touching it. And so they get into the temple. They get to the Holy of Holies, the most sacred place in all of Jerusalem. They put the Ark down. And then they forget to take the poles out. Or maybe they don't forget. I tend to think they actually did it on purpose. But it seems like it's strange, right? At least it's strange to me. It's like you've got this beautiful thing. You've thought of every little detail. And then you've got these posts sticking out of the ark for no reason. They can be only seen from the next layer out where the priests could be, where most people couldn't. But still, what's the point? You've heard me talk about the Bible Worm podcast that I've uh, been using. It's uh, by Reverend Dr. Amy uh, Robertson and Robert Williamson. And uh, they, I love some of the stuff that they put together, but they asked the same question, why? And they said that maybe it was there as the physical reminder to the priests that God was in residence, that it's not just an empty room that you can use for storage. This is the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant is there and God is there. I think that's a good point. I also think that it's a reminder that God can move. It's a reminder that God is not static. God is not in a box. God goes with the people. That if and when the temple is no longer suiting the purposes that it was originally called to do, God can move. 
Now we don't know where the Ark of the Covenant is. Ask Indiana Jones, and you know, have a lot of different options for where it might be. Ask a lot of conspiracy theorists, and you have a lot of different options for where it might be too. And so, at the end of the day, the the, the Ark is not the only place that God resides. But for us, it is that physical reminder when we read of it in Scripture that it is movable, that God is in the temple. But God is also with the people. And so I wonder how often we build temples in our lives. And building of temples is neither good nor bad. Like Solomon, we don't know whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. It's what we do with them that is, that, that the proof is in the pudding of what we do with them. Are the temples that we build, whether they be physical buildings, whether they be in our own minds or in our own spirits, are those temples that we build, those monuments that we build, built to glorify God, to praise God's name and to show God's love to the world? Or are they meant and built as jail cells, meant to confine God, meant to constrict God, meant to make God manageable? Because let's face it, when God is all over, God is not so manageable at least by us. What do we need to hear and see and learn to help us keep God as the central, central part of our lives? As I said, sometimes we do that really well and sometimes we don't. So how do we keep coming back to this over and over and over again? Because in the end, it doesn't matter. If God is in a tent, as in the time of David, if God is in a temple, as in the time of Solomon, or if God is in neither, as in our own time, God chooses again and again and again to reside with the people. God chooses again and again and again to be with humanity, to be with God's people. The question is whether or not we reciprocate, whether or not we choose to be with God and to make our own places, our own hearts, our own minds, our own spirits, our own places, a place where God can reside. I hope we do. Amen. As people of the United Church of Canada, we proclaim our faith with the words of a new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God and his witness, we are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's face it, none of us probably have the resources to build a temple as large and beautiful as that gold decked as uh, Solomon's was. But that doesn't mean that we then turn around and say, well, then I don't have anything to give. We offer ourselves to God, our time, our talents, our treasure, everything that we are, everything that we have, we give to God's work. And so I invite you to think about what it is that you might bring to this time and place today as we sing our offertory. What can I do? What can I do? What can I bring? What can I bring? What can I say? What can I say? What can I say? What can I say? I'll sing with joy. I'll sing with joy. I'll say a prayer. I'll say a prayer. I'll bring my love. I'll bring What can I do? What can I do? What can I bring? What can I bring? What can I say? What can I say? What can I say? I'll sing with joy. I'll sing with joy. I'll say a prayer. I'll say a prayer. I'll bring my love. I'll do my share. These are the works of our hands.
and the love of our hearts. May they be used to further your work in this church and in the world around us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. October 31st is, as well as being Halloween, is also known as Reformation Day. Um, and Reformed churches across the world celebrate that on the closest Sunday, the last Sunday in October. It happens to be today. And so today we celebrate uh, the beginning, not the, the, what is thought to be the beginning, it probably wasn't, but the, the thought of the beginning of the Reformation. Uh, when Martin Luther decided to write down 95 things that he thought uh, maybe could be done better in the church and went and instead of, you know, giving it to somebody and saying, hey, let's have a conversation, he went and took his hammer and nailed it to the door. Uh, that was about a response. I think it's important to remember that Luther was not, um, was not trying to start, he was not actually trying to start a new denomination or a new movement within Christianity. He was simply trying to reform what he saw as being things that were challenging about the church. And reformers continue to happen today. So this is not a Protestant versus Catholic, one is better than the other kind of day. This is a reminder that the church is always being called to look at ourselves, to look at what we do right, what we do wrong, and to come back again and always to God. So our prayers to the people today was written by Katrina Manzi and adapted from the book of Common Worship. Um, but it, it makes reference to the fact that it's Reformation Sunday. Um, and the last part of it is actually using some of the words of Calvin, who was another reformer. Uh, and so I thought I'd give you that little bit of history before we use this prayer. So let us pray. Almighty and loving God, our help and our hope. We thank you for your love that extends from everlasting to everlasting, for our blessings great and small, for our friends, family, community, and church. On this Reformation Sunday, we thank you for the example of all the saints who have gone before us, who guide us by their example and show us your way. We thank you that you are not done with us yet that you keep guiding and prodding the church to be a church ever reforming and ever closer to who you call us to be. We thank you most of all for sending your son Jesus so that we might have eternal life. We know that you, O oh God, are concerned with the joys and sorrows that characterize our lives and listen to us if we call on you. We pray that you defend the weak and right what is wrong. Give relief to the poor, the hungry, the homeless, and the refugees. We ask that those who suffer any sickness or weakness be made healthy and strong. That those who are troubled be given rest and understanding. That those who are lonely and alienated find fellowship and love that those who grieve and sorrow find comfort and assurance. We pray that you give comfort and hope to the dying, strength to caregivers, and courage to those who are afraid. We pray, O oh God, for our nation and for the nations of this world. We ask that you inspire and guide leaders to seek justice and do kindness. And we pray that you take away the mistrust and lack of understanding that divide us so that we may live in peace and do your will in the world. We pray for people who are of different faiths than us and for those of no faith, for all people are created in your image and have dignity and worth. Save us from fear and give us courage to hold fast to what is good. Strengthen us to love one another, to not repay evil for evil, but to overcome evil with good. As you, O oh God, have led the saints of the church in every age, so guide us now and always. Above all, give us hope. Increase our hope when it is small. Awaken it when it is dormant. Confirm it when it is wavering, strengthen it when it is weak, and raise it up when it is overthrown. 
give us hope to sustain us all our days until that last day when we, with all your faithful saints, will dwell with you in our eternal home. We ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, as we continue praying together in his words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is number 62 in More Voices. That's our spiral bound book. It's called There is Room for All, and we will sing it twice through. May God lift up the light of her countenance upon you and give you peace this day and always. Amen.